let's get into a couple of these guitars with which I have a contentious relationship. You know, I was at a small gathering of repair people a couple of weeks back, and somehow the subject of Hensel guitars came up, and people turned around, and they looked at me, and they pointed, and they hissed in this accusatory tone, You're the world's foremost expert! And it was like Donald Sutherland at the end of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, you know? It was like, oh, resignation. Yeah, okay. You're probably watching this video as a result of a Hensel repair I made several years ago, which was snapped up by the YouTube algorithm um, because I gave it a clickbait title that was entirely tongue-in-cheek, because at that point I had like 250 followers, most of whom I knew were people in the biz, and it was just supposed to be an in-joke. Anyway, I get contacted by people wanting to know the particulars about their Hensel guitar, and most of the time I have to disappoint them, because there just isn't very much information. Dating them accurately is impossible. There are no serial numbers. Um, there are a number of different stylistic features, which may correspond to different periods, but we don't know. He also made small numbers of mandolins and maybe arch tops too. But as for a company history, it's non-existent. We know that Arthur Hensel came to Canada he made guitars commercially in Toronto between the mid-1930s and the early 50s, but also apparently continued to do it as a hobby after that, when he was in a kind of semi-retirement. He built these for the R.S. Williams & Sons Company. How many guitars? Impossible to say. Probably a lot, relatively speaking, given the number that are still around and that continue to surface. This leads me to believe that he probably had a decent-sized staff, on his payroll. Construction-wise, they're quite similar to Regal guitars from the U.S. Some are ladder-braced, some are X-braced, some have binding on them, some don't. Some have binding on the front face but not on the back. Um, they do tend to be rather austere in their decoration because they're inexpensive guitars. The coolest thing about them is definitely the headstock branding, which is carved or punched in here by hand. They're all different. It wasn't done with a pantograph carver or something. Someone sat there and did this to every single guitar. Then we come to value. There are wildly different valuations on these guitars. Everything from $400 on up to... I heard one place recently in the East Coast was trying to get more than 2000 These are made of decent materials. They're not as refined as the upper-end collector's guitars of the period, and there are things about them that, as a repair guy, just annoy the heck out of me, because I have to do this little dance and not step on anyone's dreams, but these are not Martins. They were never Martins. They will not be Martins. No magic in the world will turn them into a Martin. One of the main stumbling blocks is the bridge is usually in the wrong location. And it's not a little bit off, it's very off. So the scale length does not match up with the fret placement. In most cases, the holes for the bridge pins are misaligned with the bridge pad. So, they're half on, half off. And that's kind of a big deal, too. You can't expect great intonation without a lot of work. And in this case, someone has been thoughtful and has already moved the bridge for me. They did it in such a way that involved screws, and uh, they managed to split the bridge in a horrible fashion. So, yeah. The frets on these are very narrow, they're quite sharp, and they don't extend over the binding, which makes them pretty uncomfortable to play on. They all have ridiculously high action, which happens with 80-year-old guitars that have been, you know, kept strung up in a closet, but these tend to be even worse than normal. You know, you see here, these strings are not even a tension. So, it leads me to suspect that they left the shop with really, really high action to begin with, and many show evidence of a nut riser, so it's possible they were set up for Hawaiian play, but at this stage, they all desperately need neck resets, and extreme ones, which is a thing when it comes to $500 guitars. You know, there's the retail sales price right out the window. You're already underwater as soon as you pick it up, and with everything else that needs doing, it gets kind of ridiculous and daunting. So, no one ever lets me do all the things, and in the end it feels like a compromise. 
I can get them playable, but not to a professional standard. This time, finally, it's different. I've got a player who's going to let me do it all and really take this to the limit. You know, he picked it up for a song, so there's room in the budget. At the end, though, if you see one of these things for sale that's more than a thousand bucks, realistically, you're paying for a whole lot of someone's time and effort that went into resurrecting it, rather than maybe its innate value, if you know what I mean. Here's another one that has shown up with some fret issues. I worked on this one a couple of years back, trying to undo some previous person's attempts at repair. This one actually had the bridge inlaid into the top in an effort to try and lower the action. Well, I pulled it out and plugged it and such. Um, and then it made the rounds after me, and someone else did some more things to it. They made a wider bridge to try and cover the, um, the finish material that was lost when it was moved forward. So, I'm not kidding. This guitar probably has $2,000 worth of repair work in it at this point, and it's still got the original frets. Someone did a kind of neck reset on this that didn't involve tipping the neck angle. They made a big riser and slid the neck upwards. You can see just how much it had to rise. It looks a bit weird, but it's functional, kind of. The thing is, there was no allowance for what the neck and body might do in this new relationship with each other. I think the fingerboard extension was made to run in line with the neck, so that it was perfectly flat in the same plane, or perhaps even pitched up slightly when it got glued together. And then some settling occurred, and now we have what's known as a rising tongue. Um, it's like a ski jump. This is the reason that most acoustic guitars have what we call fall-away over the body where the board or the frets are dressed downwards at an angle towards the sound hole. This gives a little extra clearance when you're doing hard strumming um, in the place where the strings tend to vibrate in their widest path, but it also allows for some deforming of the top or the neck. In this case, the rise is big enough that it's seriously choking out the strings around the 11th, 12th frets. But the geometry here makes it kind of tricky. I'm going to have to see how much I can dress off the fret height to make it work. Because again, budgetary constraints. Now the real way to do this would be to pull the frets, dress the board, reinstall frets. He doesn't want to put that much money in, so these base side frets might end up so low that they're just decorative. Which, you know, nobody plays bass strings up here on a 12 fret guitar. It's like the upper frets on an F5 mandolin. We're going to do what we can. From fret to fret, there isn't a whole lot of inconsistency until you get up really high. But from a wider view, you can see how the distortion creates the effect of insane amounts of relief, but it's false. The free portion of the neck is actually almost dead straight. So the frets towards the end of the board here are actually quite tall, looking around 45 thousandths, whereas over the neck, they're about 40 thousandths. So there's some to dress off and then some, so I'm really going to scrub away a whole lot of material on the end here. Apologies for my voice this week. I've had another bout of the virus. So here I've made myself a little ramp using tape to um, dress down at an angle using both files and sanding. I've removed more than 30 thousandths worth of fret height on the ones on the end here. Um, they're down around 12 to 15 thousandths which is less than half any respectable fret's height. So, I mean, I'm going to try and recrown them, but objectively, there's no way. I'm just going to sort of ease the corners and then rub some sandpaper on them and polish them up and call them done. Um, because, you know, this is not a real fret anymore. It's decorative. <laughs> I don't know why, but this makes me laugh. Let's talk about this bridge that was put on by someone after me. This was a lefty conversion. Someone else put on this one. Then someone plugged and rerouted it back to righty. It's too wide. It looks weird. There is a proportion thing with straight bridges. If they're more than an inch and a quarter wide, it just gets visually disturbing. It's like your mind can cope with the fact that there's exposed wood or a different color from the bridge being moved, 
but a bridge this size screams, there's something wrong here. It's a well-made bridge. Just looks weird. Okay, back to the other guitar now. I'm going to measure the string spacing at the bridge here, which um, is a little wide, I think, for this neck. So I'm not sure this was ever functional. If you see how the um, high E string there is so close to the ends of these very short frets, like you probably couldn't fret it a lot of the time without running right off, which is incredibly annoying. If you've had a guitar that does that, you know what I mean. With full width frets, we can probably get away with this spacing. So they move the bridge, but the saddle placement is still wrong. It's about a millimeter too far towards the back end, which is better, I guess. Yeah, not good on the base side. So this bridge should be taken as visual guidance only. But I want to know where the um, the holes for the bridge pins are, basically. It's around, I'm guessing about 22, 22 and a half. It's hard to judge because of the splits. We'll remove the hardware. These are machine screws with nuts on the inside, like a Gibson. But the pilot holes weren't made large enough, so the screws threaded themselves into the bridge, which made cracks inevitable. I'll get the bridge nice and warm with my little miniature heat blanket and remove it using pallet knives. The adhesive used seems to have been dyed black, which is a little weird. I guess to disguise any gaps that may have appeared between the bridge and the soundboard, but it's pretty messy stuff. I'll use some of the gelled acetic acid solution from Stumac, they call it de-glue goo, to try and soften it. And while that's having a chance to activate, I'll remove the pick guard. People get so incensed about the screws. Then I'll set up the heating iron to remove the fingerboard extension. It took a whole lot of scraping to get off the glue. I think this repair had been done a long time ago, judged by the hardware and just the dryness of everything. The fingerboard extension is now warm enough to get a knife under. Not sure how they managed to do it, but the previous person left the steel positioning pins still on the top. These are characteristic for Hensel. Can't really hide the holes this time because uh, Hensel used a very short dovetail. It's just about a quarter of an inch, maybe a little bit longer. I didn't hit the pocket this time, but I know there's going to be enough heat transferred that uh, the entire joint's going to get nice and loose anyway. Because this guitar is currently missing a couple of back braces, I'm going to slide my um, brace prop device in there to um, give it a little bit of support. As my neck removal jig does, you know, put some pressure on the body near the sides, where it's usually pretty secure, but, you know, better safe than sorry. Once again, these are foam cutters from Hot Wire Foam Factory. Rather than the tapered dovetail you find on Martin's, Hensel used a straight sliding dovetail. These can be more difficult to remove. It takes prolonged wiggling. Went back and forth a number of times adding pressure from the screw, pushing the neck up a little bit more each time. This is about 15 minutes worth of work. Let's build a bridge. Got a nice old blank of rosewood here, which I'll plane square. Mark out the position for the pinholes. Drill those out. Get things to the correct thickness. And do some shaping along the back edge.
I'm marking the length of the wings with some tape so that when I take it to the spindle sander I know when to stop. I'm going for something like a 1940s Gibson bridge. Here's an original Hensel. Um, there's the metal pins that he used to stick into the soundboard. They're an odd shape. They're like triangular, uh, with the highest point being at the very front edge of the bridge. And they're ridiculously tall. Uh, it's almost half an inch, which is just bizarre. But anyway, I'm going to uh, sand things up a little bit, plug some holes in the soundboard, because I'm going to be using a slightly different spacing. This shot is demonstrating that the center seam in the soundboard often has no relation to the actual center line of the body or the neck. It's not a reliable benchmark. Instead, I'm using the neck to try and create some parameters for myself. Okay, this is really thrown off by the fact that this fingerboard is not a regular piece of geometry, in that this angle on this side is different from the one on this side. They splay at different angles from the center line. This is probably why even replacement bridges are glued on in the wrong place and at weird angles. Got some sandpaper and I'll shape the underside of the bridge to the top contour. The scratch marks produced here provide a guide for me when I'm scraping the bottom of the bridge. I remove those and get closer to a proper fit. Before I glue it on, I want to wash the bottom of the surface using some acetone. This leaches off a considerable amount of resin, which can make uh, bonding a little less reliable. I also put a preliminary coat of finishing oil on the edges of the bridge, which helps resist any glue squeeze out that might find its way there. Get things clamped up. Let's have a look at the inside. You can see that there is a back brace that's just barely holding on and evidence of a missing one. The braces are fairly robust. The tone bars in this case are very tall and shaped in a exuberant kind of way, scalloped. I think that this is a later guitar because the bridge pad has shifted back so the holes are completely on it. This one also has a metal reinforcement bar in the neck too, which is something he probably couldn't have gotten away with during the war. So I'm guessing this is probably late forties. The upper back brace is loose as well, and I want to get that stuck down before going into the neck resetting procedure, just so the geometry is kind of locked in. And obviously this takes some creative thinking. The tuners on these guitars have usually been switched out at some point because the originals, although they look pretty well made, can be pretty squirrely. They have peened on gears that don't sit square on the base plate. It's just, it's an odd system. Going to go with a larger Gibson size side dot markers this time. I'll clean out some of the glue. These were glued all around the dovetail and against the body. I'm keeping the dovetail in place, but I'm actually turning this into a bolt on because the dovetail not being tapered, removing so much for the angle basically destroys the locking function of it. It would take a lot to rebuild. Um, it becomes something like a straight tenon. But sandpaper pulling proceeds as usual to tip the neck back. Experience tells me I need about a 32nd of an inch clearance over the top of the bridge to make it work for these guys. Drilling the through hole for the bolt, and I'll sink a corresponding anchor into the heel, uh, reinforced with super glue to make sure it's locked in place. After all that adjustment, you can see just how angled the fingerboard extension now is. So I'll make a support wedge to go under it and take up some of that space. Got a piece of holly here, which is about a sixteenth of an inch thick to start. And uh, I'll just make it a simple tapered wedge. Taking a free second to cut some fret wire. We're going with something more robust this time. This is about 90 thousandths wide versus the original super skinny stuff. Then glue on the fingerboard extension. It's time to route the saddle slot after careful measurement to make sure it's in the right spot. These always seem to need a bridge pad overlay because the ball ends of the strings have torn up the bridge pad. Turning my attention to the neck now, going to change the original radius, which was somewhere around like 20. Um, going to change it to a 16. These slots are too narrow for standard modern wire, so I have to enlarge them. 
I'm using my scratch tool here to widen the top and give my Dremel burr something to key off of. This is a 0.6 millimeter carbide fluted end mill. The key is to always pull it towards you while you're sighting down the slot. If you push it, you'll end up breaking the bit, which happens anyway from the stresses involved. But usually I can get about a board and a half out of them before that happens. A foot pedal would be helpful for this job. It takes time. You need high speed, too slow when the bit gets bogged down. And I always work from sort of the center out towards the edge, then flip the guitar around and do the opposite side. Eventually this happens, which is why I buy these things by the dozen. Here I'm reaming for the bridge pins. The ones that come with the Hensel, if they're still around, they're not the standard taper you find in modern Gibson or Martin, so just be aware. Here I'm cutting the ends of the frets that are over the fingerboard extension, protecting the top with a piece of scraper material. Polishing, polishing, etc. Hensels came with rosewood nuts with rather carefree string spacing. So I'm making a new one out of bone. Trying to get braces glued and clamped up when they're far away from the sound hole and way down in the guitar is always a bit of a pleasure. To replace the lost braces, I have some African mahogany that I heat treated some years ago. It's dark and dry and matches the appearance of the guitar's interior. So I'll plane that up to size. Put on a slight curve for the uh, gluing surface. Then taper the top surface a bit so it's kind of triangulated. Pare away the ends. These are slightly longer than necessary so that I can cut back and make sure that it meets the lining. I chop a little bit off the ends and gradually sneak it up so that it's in the right position. After that I use a variety of jacks and annoyance. Uh, this is something that really does a number on your hands, trying to get these things in position. On this one near the sound hole I can use some props. Turning my attention to the headstock I had to plug some holes from previous screws. The back is pretty messed up with a bunch of weird scrapes. So I'm just using a little bit of um, alcohol-based marker to touch some of those up. With the saddle installed, I can work on the intonation points. And finally, install a set of tuners repurposed from a national. I think those look classy. Okay, that is as much as I can do. This is the ultimate tricked-out Hensel, correcting all the usual points of contention, the only thing I might like would be an adjustable truss rod, but it's fine without it. I've put 12s on, the action is 664ths on the bass, 4 on the treble, and I expect it will settle in a little bit and need a touch up on the action in the next week or two, but there's plenty of saddle height. And the intonation is very good. With all that, sonically, it's still not at the level of, say, a Kel Croydon or a Kalamazoo. This one might actually even be a bit overbraced, but I'm not going back in there and cutting any of it out. Enough's enough. And no, objectively, it's not worth it. The amount of work that goes in, I might as well build one. I'm seriously thinking about that. Maybe making a limited series with this shape and the general decorative scheme, put the bridge in the right place, and then, you know, call it a day and never revisit the idea again. Because I've had enough Hensels for a while. 